In this brief lecture, I'm going to go over Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rime of the Ancient Mariner from 1798. Let's start with the author and his contemporary, William Wordsworth. What we want to focus on here is the significant contributions that each of these guys made towards what we could call the poetic theory that would make possible the lyric ballad. The lyric ballad being really the combination of two distinct forms of poetry, the lyric poem and the ballad, and I'll get to that in just a minute. What's the theory that they developed? Essentially, it's that poetry could be written using ordinary speech. Uh, Wordsworth said, the language of real life. The idea here being that colloquial language, the way that we really talk to one another out in the world, right, instead of the classroom or the courtroom or formal settings, is a break um, from tradition, right? And that to the extent that it's a departure from tradition, specifically neoclassical form, that it could powerfully change the way that we look at literature. So in a lot of their writings, we'll see an emphasis on what feels like real people uh, in contrast to the neoclassical sort of tropes of these larger than life figures. For Coleridge and Wordsworth, you have a grittier depiction of uh, ordinary life. So like we've seen already this year when talking about romanticism, when we were looking, for example, at Goethe uh, in Coleridge and Wordsworth, you have simple natural characters. Um, they are important for their individuality. Uh, their freedom is important, right? The fact that they are individuals in the first place is a significant starting point for the poetry. Uh, human emotion is something that is to be uh, prized, something that is to be uh, evaluated. It's not something that's to be condemned or denied. And we've talked a lot this year about how this idea that reason or rationality has to master emotion is a very old idea in the West. It goes back at least to the ancient Greeks. You see it all over Plato and so on and so forth. So that's not how romanticism works. Romanticism is precisely the opposite. Uh, emotional being is prized. You also, in the sort of English romanticism that Coleridge and Wordsworth are essentially credited with establishing, have a emphasis on creativity and the power of the imagination, right? This idea that humans have this almost godlike ability to create things out of nothing uh, is remarkable, right? Uh, and you see this, you know, as a recurrent strand going throughout their work. Lastly, you have in their poetry a emphasis on how humans fit in with and respond to the natural world. And in Coleridge's Ancient Mariner, that's obviously an, an enormous focal point. So the lyric ballad, as I said, it's almost like a synthesis of the traditional lyric poem and the ballad. Um, so let's break it down into the two parts and look at what goes into uh, each of these and then the final product. So a lyric poem is typically an emotional poem. It focuses on interiority. It focuses on what the speaker is thinking. Um, a ballad, by contrast, is narrative. It tells a story, in other words. So when you combine these two into the new form of the lyric ballad, you're supposed to have a way to express or encompass the new realities in this new world. So in other words, it's a new perspective. It's a new way of looking at things. Uh, and the form here, the lyric ballad, where you have a story that is, you know, told, but you get a lot of information about the feelings of the mariner as you go through. Um, you can see how this is different from, again, that neoclassical approach uh, to literature, to philosophy. So the intense imagery that you have as well in uh, a lot of lyric ballads uh, couples with lofty intellectual ideas. It's not that English romanticism or some of the works of literature that are exemplars of English romanticism 
uh, are anti-intellectual or dumbed down. In fact, it's, it, quite the opposite is true. Uh, you have heavy intellectual themes. So the result of intellectual themes uh, juxtaposed with this intense imagery, which we'll talk about in a minute, has a, a determinant result, and that is you have a powerful poem that's both, on the one hand, poetically pleasing, right? It has all of the formal qualities, all of the sound and the sense that's so aesthetically endearing uh, to us. On the other hand, you also have something that's emotionally challenging. Um, the Rime of the Ancient Mariner is, if you really think about it, if you really read it closely, it's thoroughly upsetting. It's thoroughly disconcerting. Um, and the reason why that is, is the, uh, again, the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions that we see the speaker, uh, namely the Mariner, expressing. Okay, so let's look at the sources for this poem. Uh, really, the central action was suggested by Coleridge's friend, Wordsworth. Uh, he had been reading a text called A Voyage Around the World by Way of the Great South Sea um, by a, an author named Shelvock. And in that text, uh, someone on a boat, a member of a crew, shoots an albatross. Uh, which had been following the ship along in bad weather. So uh, that clearly uh, fits in with what you have going on in Coleridge's poem. There's another really important uh, source, and that is a dream of a skeleton ship that one of Coleridge's friends told him. So just this friend had this crazy dream about a spectral seagoing vessel, and he told it to, to his buddy, and then uh, Coleridge packed some of those ideas into his, his very famous poem. Thirdly, you have religion. Um, Wordsworth was a pantheist. Pantheist is a term for people who think, if I can just really reduce it to, to something that's probably overly um, simplistic, God is everything. You don't have a personal God. You don't have the idea of, of heaven and the afterlife and the concern over sin and all that sort of stuff. For a pantheist, God equals nature, essentially. Um, it's a very old idea. It's, it's probably advocated most famously in, in Western philosophy by Spinoza. If you want to take a look at that, the text would be uh, Ethics is the name. Um, so that's Wordsworth's religious worldview. Coleridge, by contrast, is Christian. Uh, and you can see aspects of his Christianity throughout the rhyme of the ancient mariner, specifically this recurrent motif of redemption. Okay, so the reason why I gave you the information on Wordsworth, despite the fact that he's not the author and uh, he's not even a Christian, is you do have certain pantheistic uh, elements in the poem to the extent that it's so focused on the natural world, um, which I'll get to in just a minute. Okay, the background and setting. So the Mariner is sailing from Europe to the South Pole and back. And we find that he's essentially, uh, as he's on this, uh, this trip, recounting a tale of terror, right? Um, or, or we should, you know, it would be more accurate to say that he's telling the story of going to the South Pole and back. Um, so we call it a tale of terror because he is hounded by supernatural forces that relentlessly pursue him after he kills an albatross that had been following the boat. But in the poem, you have uh, a lot more than just this focus on terror, right? Um, you also have the idea that action, when it is not sufficiently reflective or premeditated, can be destructive. Uh, and this is precisely what we see the mariner do, right? He doesn't really kill the, the albatross for any specific reason. It's just this mindless, you know, default decision that he makes that ultimately he, of course, laments. It's like someone who just mindlessly throws trash out of, out of the window of their car or something. Um, so this unthinking action that, that results in destruction for him uh, is tied to this melting away of the phenomenal world. The phenomenal world means the world that you experience sensuously, right? So via your senses, your sight, uh, your, your taste, your, your touch, so on and so forth. Uh, in Greek, phenomena literally is uh, 
that which appears, right? So the visible world is what we're talking about. This visible world is melting away as the mariner is, is getting older. And his new world, this supernatural world that he's starting to b become increasingly aware of, is exceedingly nightmarish when you compare it to the phenomenal world, the visible world that he leaves behind. Now, you want to be careful. He never really supersedes entirely or totally the phenomenal world. Elements of both worlds are present at all times throughout uh, the duration of the poem. But the Mariner is symbolically separated from humanity, from that phenomenal world as he drifts in the middle of the, of the ocean. elaborate a little bit on uh, this aspect of uh, supernaturalism in his poem. The poem is full of uh, strange, macabre, uncanny, or you could even say gothic uh, aesthetic elements. You're probably aware of the fact that gothic horror fiction was very popular at the time that this was written, and it's, it's also often credited with having a lot of influence. For example, I was researching the poem the other night, and uh, I saw the full text is on the Creepypasta website, and the comments are interesting. A lot of people are discussing why exactly something like this Coleridge poem would be on that site. Uh, you could take a look at that if you're interested. Um, but it's not unheard of to credit this poem with, um, again, the powerful influence that it had. For example, if you're familiar of HP, with H.P. Lovecraft, um, we're pretty sure that he was inspired a lot by the Rime of the Ancient Mariner. So you've got a number of gothic or uh, uncanny elements in this poem. Just to go through a few really quickly, uh, you have the strange manifestations of the weather, right? It's not acting as it normally does. You have uh, a good omen, specifically the albatross. You have the idea of uh, death vis-a-vis -vis life in death. You have spirits, all sorts of spirits. For example, the land of mist and snow. You have the two spirits the mariner hears in his trance. You have angelic spirits, which move the bodies of the dead men, right? All sorts of super, supernatural stuff going on there. Uh, madness, often a, a focal point in Gothic literature. Think of uh, specifically Edgar Allan Poe. It's often a, a big theme in his works. Uh, in Coleridge here, we have the madness of the pilot and his boy. Uh, and lastly, you have the Mariner's strange power of speech. When he talks, he doesn't talk the way that other people do, despite the fact that we said that Coleridge and Wordsworth are advocates of this idea that poetry should be written in ordinary real-life language. So you do have that on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's the effect, right? It's the effect of the Mariner's words that have this uncanny, intense... Um, sort of power about them. Okay, imagery and sound effects. So the poem is obviously quite vivid, uh, and the speaker describes some spectacular scenes. They're often memorable in themselves, but they have secondary symbolic influence. Um, and that symbolic influence, we should point out, there's two dimensions, two distinct dimensions to it. There's, first of all, you as a reader of the poem, right? So if I can call that like your hermeneutic position with respect to, to the text, that all that means is your interpretive stance, right? So you read it and you're able to identify certain things as symbols in the composition. So that's one dimension. The other dimension that you have is uh, sort of confined to the limits of the poem itself, internal to the poem itself. What I'm saying is that people in the poem often find uh, things that are being said to be symbolic. Okay, and that's maybe a bit unusual in literature. We don't often uh, see that necessarily, but it's thoroughly literary. Elsewhere, comparisons are made to describe things uh, in a really vivid way. For example, when the becalmed vessel is said to be, quote, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. 
as for sound effects, we have a lot of them. We have rhyme, we have uh, alliteration, even pacing, for example, uh, for the sky and the sea and the, ski, the sea and the sky. Uh, that line suggesting the slow passage of time, the mariner's weariness that results from that slow passage. It's probably something a lot of us can relate to right now in these unique times. All right, symbols. So first we have the glittering eye. Uh, eye is the window to the soul. Uh, the mariner's rivets, the, red, the wedding guest. The wedding is like uh, the new life and he is only a guest. He needs the mariner's eye uh, to show the possibility of redemption or new life. Secondly, you have the albatross, the symbol of good luck. Causes the frigid wind to blow, which releases the mariner's ship. That's why they see it as a good omen, right? It did something good. The fog lifts and the crew thinks that the bird was a bad omen. So uh, the mariner bears it around his neck as if it's a cross. It's killed with a crossbow. And I think it's pretty obvious here. You could look at the albatross um, as a sort of Christ figure. Thirdly, we have snakes. So water, water everywhere, and the water seems rotted, and snakes are constantly expelling or being expelled out of it. You also have uh, the rise of the moon and the burning shadow of the ship, which caused the snakes to gleam beautifully. Uh, and the snakes also figure centrally as we see the mariner praying. Fourth, the wind, symbol for the Holy Ghost uh, or the Holy Spirit. The idea of death and life and death. Um, it's a dice game, obviously, right? Uh, if death should win and the night rises, then men will die. Um, the mariner finds that he cannot pray, and he endures the, the horrors for seven days and seven nights. Then we have the apocalypse. This idea of, you know, the end times, days of horror and wrath, the second coming of Christ, everything seems to start to uh, fall away. You can look at the book of Revelation for biblical uh, analog to that. It's a famous work of poetry written by uh, John. And then lastly, we have the sea, a symbol for the horror of solitude. We've talked about the sea a lot this year and the various symbolic connotations that it can have. Um, you also have the sea as this uh, symbol for the truth of life. Think almost back to the way the sea is uh, described in Ernest Hemingway's The Old Man in the Sea. Okay. All right, themes. So first we have this idea that uh, all things that inhabit the natural world have inherent value and beauty and should be respected, should be valued for that reason. Look, for example, at the beauty of the sea snakes that we were just talking about a minute ago. His heart filled with love for them, and he blesses them unaware. Again, towards this idea of reverence uh, for the natural world, this line that I think a lot of you had in your, uh, your reading response quiz from a few weeks ago. He prayeth best who loveth best, all things great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. So the standard interpretation of this poem, as I'm sure you probably are aware, is that we have to learn to recognize and respect this truth uh, that the natural world is to be preserved, to be valued, to be respected. Second, we have the idea that creation has to rise out of destruction. Uh, look, for example, at the loss of the ship, the shipmates, and even the mariner's former self. All of these things occur, but the ultimate result or consequence of their occurrence is regeneration, right? Th new things are made. And then lastly, premeditation versus lack of purpose. Uh, we see the poem focus on the callous, destructive relationship that man often has with nature. And as I've said just moments ago, that's obviously problematized by Coleridge here. Uh, the consequences 
that the Mariner faces are horrifying because his action was not purposeful. So I have their premeditation versus lack of purpose. He doesn't premeditate what he does to uh, the albatross. Uh, it, it, he doesn't have purpose, okay? So uh, the development of the Mariner is intended to persuade the reader to change his or her attitude toward the natural world it has that effect. And part of the penance for the Mariner, as we know, is for him to tell his tale and hope that he can uh, reach other people with this insight that he has. So that covers us. These remarks were based on lecture notes from Mrs. Doner at Bishop Kinney. And the artwork that I included here is uh, very famous. They're from Gustave Doré, uh, 1877. Please reach out if you have any questions.